Hello everyone and welcome to a deep dive. So, what is the deal with Genshin Impact? Well, the game has been out for over a month now. We have played it quite a bit. Uh, the game has smashed records. It has been called shockingly good by PC Gamer and most of the press actually seem to have agreed. Even though it's also a mobile gacha game that does all the bad gacha game stuff, and on top of that, it's a major step forward in three areas. First, games. I mean, it's a 30 to 40 hour long open world game with zero entry fee. And it's got some genuinely fantastic content, obviously save some caveats that we will get into with long-term systems and monetization. The second thing is that of Chinese developers actually penetrating into the West with their games. MiHoYo were known in the mobile realm, but this is their PC console debut and they've absolutely nailed it. I mean, the other Chinese game that everyone's excited about, Black Myth Wukong, that is still a long way off yet. Then the third thing is that of mobile games, because Genshin Impact, while yeah, you can play it on your PC and all of that, is also a game fully made with scalability in mind that actually is a very high quality game that runs on mobile phone, PC, and console. So there's a lot to get in today, and if you've been wondering just what is up with this game, well, we've got all the answers for you. And guess what we've also got? Bam, this is one of the new things on our Patreon this month. There will be another pin and the regular art, but for now, this is the 2020 edition of our channel logo pin. So a nice little pickup you can get. And of course, that also supports our team a great deal indeed. Your support has been absolutely invaluable, allowing us to do far longer term videos like this one. So thank you very much. And with that said, let's go. Well, we've got to begin with the game and the game sure has came a long way since what? People were raging at it in protest over its Zelda similarities back in China, Joy 2019, with Sony even catching flack and someone destroying their PS4 Pro in protest. Yes, it clearly does draw inspiration from Breath of the Wild. It's bloody obvious that it does that, isn't it? Now that's more than apparent in its gorgeous aesthetic, its climbing and gliding mechanics, and the depth of its world. And at first glance, yes, it is heavily focused on exploration and environmental puzzles with a simple but good action combat system. Most of the exploration is fun, the world is packed full of minor details that really do liven it up, and then it's one of those games that has that thing where anything that looks like it could be an interesting point of interest, well, probably does actually have a puzzle or a quest attached to it. It really is a packed world, and it's a world that's actually going to be getting a third bigger with its December update. So that's a lot of that angle of the game. But what about, say, the story? Well, in the quests, the story is shockingly good. Everything except for simple dailies and random sort of in-world events is handcrafted with actually a character focus. And as much as it can, yes, stick to a lot of anime tropes, it does sometimes successfully combo things like intensive drama, slice of life, and comedy for, yeah, hours of questing with loads and loads of characters. And that is with a great presentation. I mean, it has got fully animated cutscenes that are fully voiced in multiple languages. And when we said this was a 30 to 40 hour game, I mean, that's like 30 hours of actually high quality game content, not just free to play grinding. What about the rest though? Well, that's where the grinding does come in. So the core progression is in the form of your characters, their equipment, and your adventure rank, which basically controls access to content and features. And uh, we'll get back to how some of these things actually are in a little bit. Now it is an action RPG. So let's just talk some combat real quick. It's simple enough with weapon-based attacks. It's got invulnerable animation canceling dodge, and uh, of course, two unique skills for each of its 20 characters. Now, what does give it a bit more depth is it's got an elemental reaction system. Of course, that's something we've seen before in other games, but it's just that neat stuff where you can swap between the characters in your party to do elemental combination attacks on enemies, which can be satisfying as hell. Now, this of course means that you're gonna be building your party around those elements and uh, using that to fight enemies. Now, the enemies are, I I'd say surprisingly varied, but ultimately are quite simple and clear in their designs. I mean, you'll be dodging your way, you know, from or through attacks, and then you'll be using the right elements. You know, like breaking a rock shield with geo attacks, things like that. Now, the game is longer term draw. That's where we come into the problems. So, power comes from five different things. Your character level, your weapon, your artifacts, your constellations, and your talents. Five. Character level and weapons each level up naturally up to a break point. And once they hit that point, they require materials to ascend, which is just leveling up further. Then talents are just character abilities and passive abilities, and those can, of course, be leveled up 
with a different material, because yes, it's one of those games. Artifacts are the gear in the game, and they pretty much follow standard RPG rules, where there is actually great, you know, build potential and combos to be had, but of course, that's something else that also needs to be leveled up via its leveling up system. Then the last is Constellations. They're basically a second layer of passive effects for characters, and they're unlocked by getting duplicates of characters from the Wish Gacha system where, of course, pulling dupes will give you, uh, well, get you even, another step through the constellation, meaning more effects and more power. Yeah, that's probably what you've been feeling creeping in thus far, isn't it? The gacha stuff. And this is where the video ultimately gets very business-focused and does go south in terms of the experience that many of us would want. It's a free-to-play game, and in fairness, it does not ask for a single cent to engage with most of it. But that's just like how a casino offers you cheap food, rooms, and drink, right? It's a gacha game through and through. It carries so much of that mobile gaming baggage. I mean, you'll eventually be introduced to the resin system. Oh dear. Because resin is essentially mobile game stamina. Yep, you've got dungeon-like content, okay? And doing that dungeon-like content uh, will grant you materials and rewards, and you can do those dungeons at any time. But if you want the rewards from the dungeon, you need to spend resin to get them. And that basically means that, uh, well, once you've done the content, you've got a very limited amount of actual time each day to use effectively to get stuff and to progress in this game. You can use all of your resin in about 30 minutes if you're going through the game fast enough. Now, of course, you can replenish it, but that will cost you a pretty penny. You can't basically, you can't log in and just play a really long session and just get little drips of resin because it replenishes just slow enough for that not to happen. Now in fairness, the devs have increased the regen cap in the first update, but the core problem still does remain here. Now at least you can play the body of the game for fun and all of the questing and exploration is free, but that is no excuse, right? It is part of the ongoing nightmare of games, engaging you with game systems that's basically just throwing yourself into a psychological trap. The other system then is the shop, and this is where it also is not really ideal. So the main currency is the Primo Jam, which is of course something you do get from daily play, and of course by spending real money. Now you'll spend these gems on the Wish system. And that's just your standard gacha game random roll that'll get you some stuff that maybe will be useful or maybe will be trash. Now the idea here is that you basically, right? You meet cool characters in the story, but if you want to play them, you've got to go and you've got to start spending that premium currency rolling for them with the wish system. Now in fairness, the game does give you thousands of gems up front, so your first 30 or 40 rolls of the wish system feel satisfying and earned. But that quickly does dry up, and like all gacha, characters can be available for short periods and, you know, time-limited events in the store. And those characters can then be extremely rare, like we're talking a fraction of a percent. Now, most of the pull of available items are just three-star weapons, and that's just useless filler. You don't really want those things. Getting characters feels lucky, never mind getting a five-star character from your gacha roll. Now, to get the featured character of a little event or whatever, you know, the hyped up star of a time limited event, well that can take you anywhere between 1 and 180 rolls. It's got this thing called the pity system that gives you a 50% chance at 90 rolls and it then just gives you the character flat out once you uh, do 180 rolls. Now as for what that actually costs, a single roll is 160 gems and you can get that in about two days of dailies. Now, gems are $5 for 300, so if you wanted to guarantee getting the featured character, it's only 28,880 gems, which of course is 480 US dollars. It's quite a lot of money. Remember that, uh, you know, characters then need to be rolled again six more times to unlock their maximum potential through constellations. So if you're a whale, you can easily spend thousands of dollars, thousands, getting a five star character maxed out. Now, this appeared in the new Assassin's Creed, or say, Watch Dogs Legion, where you can get a five-star granny fully down her constellation tree. Well, the developers would be absolutely crucified. Now, just because gacha is an established genre for Eastern games to go into, that does not mean that it's an okay thing that we should be fine with. So, mobile stuff, get out of here, but it probably isn't going to, because now we've got to talk about if it's worked. It has. Sensor Tower reports that Genshin made 60 million in its first week, 
$245 million in its first month. That's a lot of change. It made more money than any other mobile game in the world this month, right? In the world. And $45 million of that was in the USA. Now, how does this compare to the costs of actually making the game? Well, do that. Let's talk about MiHoYo, the developers, and their blueprint for success. Okay, so MiHoYo started off as a group of developers who were basically a trio of otaku together in university in Shanghai. They started their company with the old slogan, Tak Otaku Save the World, and they've ran with that logo ever since 2011. Now, after three attempts with middling success, they finally had their hit in 2014 on mobile, where they actually reached the top of the App Store in a month. Now, that game found success because, and you might find a theme here, it was a good game targeted at otaku, people who wanted, what, cute girls, simple, anime-like stories, and a fun game. It was a pretty good blueprint for success because it brought them in a lot of money. At one point, the iOS version reached $1.6 million per month. It's a lot of change. Now, the difference between this 2D game and their next offering basically tells the story pretty well, because they moved from that into a full 3D action game in Honkai Impact 3rd which was also a hit. It was a pretty damn good character action game on mobile. It was just last year, actually, that Matt went on a mobile game hunt after getting an iPad Air 3 and decided to try Honkai Impact 3rd after some targeted ads took him by surprise. It basically looked better than any game had any right to be on mobile. I mean, the advert for that was an in-game cutscene that seemed to be excellently produced with top-class Japanese voice actors. So not your standard run-of-the-mill sort of cheap knockoff feeling mobile game. Really good. And it turns out the game's actually really bloody well designed. It's good fun to play. Now that game was downloaded, and the stats aren't great, but it was downloaded over 35 million times in the first few weeks. And it used that same formula again, right? A good, engaging game with a lot of attack targeted things and uh, gacha mechanics. And we all know where that uh, money went, because their next game, Genshin Impact, reportedly cost $100 million to make over three years from a team that's now 500 strong. Yes, you heard those numbers right. Put them together. It's already more than doubled its money in a month. That is the power of making a great game, making it free, and then, I mean, from my perspective, making it less of a great game by doubling down on gacha mechanics, which sadly absolutely do work. There's no doubt, though, that uh, MiHoYo are basically standard bearers for Chinese developers right now. And, I mean, if the flag says, good games make lots of money, who are we to argue? It's clearly worked for them. Uh, like with Black Myth Wukong, and maybe even some smaller games like um, Zhuan Yuan Sword 7, the West might be entirely uh, sort of caught off guard by this previously rather insular Chinese development community just pumping out some really good games. Now, they're having rocky moments with this one, and a lot of those are sort of China-based, and some of them are not really something the developer can get away with, right? Like, there was the Genshin chat censorship, and of course that is a policy of basically anything that goes on in China where in-game chat is always censored, so, you know, you can't talk about, say, the events that absolutely did happen in June 1989. Now, the CCP's behavior and some cultural differences aside, we're in for an interesting period where more Chinese games are going to be entering the West. Now, I wish MiHoYo could make a game of Genshin's caliber and then just charge me 60 bucks for it, but when they can go wailing to the tune of a quarter of a billion dollars in a month, well, money talks. There's one last thing worth talking about with Genshin. It's a, it's a mobile game. It's also a PS4 game and a PC game, and outside of its bizarrely missing controller support on mobile, which pretty much would make mobile ideal, or at least, you know, extremely good, well, the game, it just looks a bit worse than mobile, and that's it. I mean, on modern phones, it can run really well. We got 60 FPS on an iPhone 11 and an iPad Air 3. That's really good. It also runs, uh, this is wild, but it runs better on good phones than it does on PS4 in some situations, which is insane. Uh, but yeah, it really has to be felt to be believed just how much this is a situation of a gorgeous open-world action game that just works really well on a mobile phone. I mean, if a lot of people don't really believe how powerful flagship phones are these days, Genshin Impact really does show what they can do, right? They're more powerful than a Switch, you know, way more. As an example, I mean, they are more expensive too, but you get my point. And what I'd say here is, this is clearly not something that's going to be the standard, but it does show that you can make a scalable game across all platforms. Like, this is a game that literally works and is a good experience on every platform. They've managed to make a PC game that's fun on mobile and a mobile game that's fun on PC. That is kind of bonkers. 
So yeah, there you go. Mobile games can maybe just be games now. And certainly, after playing, say, Dead Cells with a controller on my iPad, yeah. If mobile had better support in general, it could be a pretty damn good place. I mean, at the end of the day, the Nintendo Switch is just a cheap phone, basically, with some, you know, accessories, right? So we could get a better ecosystem for our phones. I mean, who knows what could happen? And that's basically it. That's the story of Genshin Impact. As you can see, it's a great game. It's also a gacha game. That's where all the money comes from. And I mean, look at what they were able to do moving from Honkai Impact 3rd to Genshin with the 100 million. Now that they're making absolutely bananas, crazy money, got to wonder what they're going to do for their next game. Personally, I would love them to do a Black Myth Wukong, right? To really just go full, full AAA, mega expensive, big scope, really ambitious game. Uh, I guess, I mean, Genshin Impact is actually really damn AAA in the same way that, say, Breath of the Wild is, just, you know, other than monetization. I'd love to see them do that, but when they can make a quarter of a billion dollars in a month from a game like this, I don't know, man. It doesn't seem like they have the financial incentive to do so. Anyway, that's it for me. If you want to support what we're doing in a non gacha way, well, I can guarantee that every single package we send out to the patrons will have one of these. No odds involved. I mean... You, you can buy five of these if you want. It's just not going to upgrade your constellation system or whatever. Um, but yeah, there's this. There'll be other stuff in the Patreon this month as well. But uh, yeah, we always like to do a sort of a new logo version each year. That is this year's one. But yes, that's it for me. Thank you for your support. Thank you for watching this video. Let me know what do you think about this game. And with that said, I will see you next time.